Thank you and welcome. This is the Vermont House of Representatives Education Committee and we are here on April 10th. And this morning we are gonna be looking at uh, COVID response in higher education. And this morning uh, we're gonna start with Susan Steitley of the Association of Vermont Independent Colleges. And I think what we really wanna know, um, Susan, is how's it going? What's the report from the field? Thank you for having me and, uh, and also thank you for continuing to do your difficult jobs during this difficult period. Uh, it's, it's going okay at, at the colleges. Uh, we do have uh, some students still remaining on campuses and those are mostly international students or US-based students whose homes aren't safe to go to or don't have homes to return to. So right now we have um, 609 students on various campuses. And I don't know if you have the information I sent this morning, uh, but I can sort of run down the list of where they are. So to support those students, um, essential staff are reporting to work. Maybe, maybe Avery, you could bring that list up. Sorry, I just sent it, so she's probably just getting it. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, so you'll see there uh, where, where the students are uh, being housed uh, and the campuses that, that, is, that they're on, on. And so essential workers are there supporting those students while they're on campus. Um, I don't think it's easy for those students, but uh, they're trying to observe all the state uh, restrictions uh, and you know, living separately and you know, keeping distance from each other. So um, that will most likely continue uh, until as long as this um, stay at home order is in place. All the campuses have transitioned to remote learning, online learning, and the technological piece is going pretty well. There's been a lot of creativity um, and uh, resiliency amongst getting that started. And it was helped by the fact that many of the campuses already had online programs. So it was fairly easy for them to transition. Um, internet infrastructure is a problem. Uh, still in Vermont and still where some of the students are living. So like you have rural Sterling College, uh, you know, that has internet problems up in the Northeast Kingdom and they're doing everything online. There's also students in rural areas and in urban areas who don't have access to Wi-Fi at home. And so that's making uh, things difficult for them. So I know, you know, broadband has always been an issue in Vermont and we urge you to continue working on that because in situations like this, it's really key that students have access to that. For the students, um, there's a lot of challenges. You know, they've been through a lot of an emotional roller coaster this semester, uh, having to relocate. SI 900 students from SIT had to return to the state uh, and then go home. Um, the cancellation of commencement. So for seniors, it's been a really uh, rocky road and disappointing time. And then the transition to online learning uh, can be difficult for some students. Um, so, you know, students are at home having trouble focusing. Some students have had to go back to work. Uh, one student on the border of New Hampshire is working at Walmart to support uh, his or her family. Uh, so those are all challenges that students are really ha having. So the colleges have their support systems in place uh, and are working to track those students that are having trouble uh, and keep in touch with them. But there are going to be students who aren't going to make it this semester uh, because of that. So uh, just a few examples that I put in the report of what the colleges are doing. They're providing self-care workshops. They're reaching out to students online, um, doing telemedical services online. The ELS has a medical health team uh, trying to do well-being exercises and advice and, and also keep the communities together uh, through chatting. Um, and, and to provide counseling and anxiety and fear and um, inter isolated connectedness. So this, they're all the colleges are really reaching out to their students in that way. But to give you a personal example, one of the teachers told me of a student uh, who was back in a urban area in his neighborhood this week. There were seven shootings on one night and one person was murdered. Uh, his Wi-Fi access in his home is really limited. 
So of course he's, you know, we're at, everything is closed. So he can't go to whatever might be, have been available in his neighborhood to get Wi-Fi access. Um, and keeping track of that students and the teachers and uh, the community are reaching out to him, but he's gone off the grid right now. So we are gonna see uh, a decline in enrollment uh, and some students lost this semester and probably not coming back uh, next semester. Um, did want to particularly mention Landmark College because they serve students with learning disabilities. So they've been working hard with those students. They did already have some online programs, so that has helped. Um, but particularly that group of students needs extra support. And you know, the, in, on campus, they get personalized attention and personalized learning plans. And so all of that is now helping happening through online, which is really difficult for students that might be challenged to work that way. So I think almost every college is facing that, uh, that there's some students um, that are having a hard time with the transition, whether it just be kept of online, uh, having to support their families, being in a, an environment that's not conducive to doing college work. For the colleges, future planning is really difficult. Um, you know, most are anticipating that they'll lose 10% of their students right now uh, for this semester. And, and, and there's estimates about how much fall enrollment will down, maybe up to 30%. You'll have students who are afraid or to come back or families that are afraid to send them back, students who are gonna be afraid to fly, um, and students who are gonna be, have started different lives, like having to work and support their family. So we're looking at a dip in fall enrollment. Um, the colleges have taken a huge, huge financial hit already, uh, refunding tuition and board. Uh, it's gonna be loss, more lost revenues. The um, Federal Care, CARES Act uh, is providing some relief, but it's really insufficient. It's a drop a drop in the bucket. And I know there's talk about another uh, fourth stimulus package coming, but I think it's gonna be impossible to make these colleges whole. Uh, so definitely we're gonna need more financial help. Uh, I know the governor is gonna have some money coming from the CARES Act that should be designated for higher education. And I hope you'll consider looking at that to provide some support to the students, not only at the public colleges, but the private colleges as well. I did want to mention um, what the colleges are doing to help support the state and local entities during this time. And I won't go through this entire list. You know, you've probably heard of some of them. Goddard College has been in the news a lot um, with their possible plan of uh, supporting homeless um, and disabled populations that are vulnerable, uh, that need some housing and maybe have COVID symptoms but don't need to be hospitalized. Um, others, colleges have been in touch with hospitals and are working on agreements with them. Norwich has provided everything that they could as far as gloves, uh, laboratory goggles, sanitizing wipes. Uh, they've also given to their town their annual um, gift that they give them early so that there's no cash flow problem. Um, and St. Michael's, of course, has a, uh, an EMT squad and they're working with the local police department and all are willing and want to stand up uh, and to be here to support the, 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 the community of Vermont. One of the big issues around that, and I think it's one of the issues why Goddard hasn't been able to finalize its contract is the liability issues. And although that is being put into the contracts that are being drafted, it's really got to be the colleges have to have immunity from liability. If they get one lawsuit from having medical personnel on, on their campuses or uh, you know the vulnerable population, that could destroy the college. I have asked the governor, um, I sent him to issue a, a, an executive order giving immunity to the colleges. I'm hoping he might do that today, although I uh, don't really anticipate that he will. But um, in which case, I'll be coming back and maybe he will do it later. I, I haven't gotten an update on that. It would be much faster to have an executive order granting immunity to the colleges, then they could just step right up when needed instead of having to go through a, a contract negotiation. 
Uh, if he's unwilling to do that, I'll be back at the legislature asking for legislation to give the colleges uh, immunity. They, they want to be there, they're willing to be there, and uh, they just need to be protected. So I'm hoping you will support that. Lastly, um, I was asked to talk about the legislation uh, S224 about post-secondary uh, institutional closings. I would respectfully ask that the committee strike, um, let me just get it here. Um, you know, the, the first section uh, uh, of that, uh, that puts the onerous A A1, section 175 A1 that has uh, AVIC, uh, being members being responsible for uh, colleges that haven't taken care of their college records. Um, you know, AVIC is a, an association, really a trade membership group, uh, like the Vermont Farm Bureau. Uh, I think if a Vermont farmer had uh, an environmental accident or incident and couldn't pay for it, you wouldn't be asking all the farmers to contribute to that. Uh, we can, because we are not a system, we're not like the state colleges. Uh, so I would ask that that be struck. Um, and, um, you know, this legislation, of course, got started because of the Burlington College issue. In the last year, we've had four other colleges close. Uh, same, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, Green Mountain College, Southern Vermont College, um, College of St. Joseph and Marlboro will be closing at the end of this semester. And all those institutions have uh, taken care of their academic records. So this is legislation because of one unique institution. And I think it's um, always a dangerous precedent to legislate for one unique uh, situation. Uh, in the legislation on page two, I think there's, we had proposed um, that each institution, as soon as they go on uh, probation, that within 60 days of being placed on probation, they have to submit an academic plan to the secretary uh, for approval. Um, and that gives plenty of time, you know, probation usually lasts for two years, uh, sometimes although that hasn't happened, but um, it puts it, the burden where it should be on the institution and it puts it with them up front of developing that plan quickly and getting approval. And then the legislation that's already in existence allows you know, for a remedy should that not happen. Um, so I, I propose that that is sufficient. Uh, and then I would also ask that the last section be struck section two on transition, uh, if you strike the first, because that, um, that is when the, it goes into effect and when each member um, must um, sign the MOU. So I welcome questions on any of those topics, like more about the colleges and what they're doing and students uh, or this as well. Okay, sorry. Um, so would you suggest then that this we're not we're not looking for things we're not looking for work right now we are basically focused on things that are really must pass so th if this waited another year this would not be a problem for you it would not be a problem okay um do you know what the finance do you, do you know, have any what's the what is the the stimulus from cares right now for the independent colleges uh, you know, the allotment just came out yesterday, uh, and I haven't had a chance to uh, add up the numbers uh, for the private colleges. So that, so they're, um, what they're going to get directly, uh, what each college is going to get directly in grants for students. So that information was, just became available yesterday. So I'll try, I'll add, I want to look at that today and I'll get that to you. So we have expectations that there may be some other, uh, others of our independent uh, colleges that are going to be potentially uh, facing closure. Is that possible? That's certainly possible. Okay, questions? Um, Representative Conlon. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I guess you kind of just touched on it, Kate. I, I'm, you know, I think as everybody is very concerned, we already had some private colleges that were teetering on the brink, looking at lower enrollment. Now they're having to, um, you know, pay refunds for housing and and 
board uh, and then potentially looking at even lower enrollment next year. Uh, so it does seem like we, we, this, this could be a, a bleak situation. Uh, Susan, are, are, are these guys in contact with one another on a regular basis? Um, and uh, are, they, are they all sort of having kind of a uniform policy in terms of refunds of, uh, of lodging and, and food? Have, have they figured out how to, how to do that or if they can even afford to do that? I guess let me ask, how many of them can't even afford to do that? Um, no one has said at this point that they can't afford to do that, but they're looking at their budgets. So AVIC is holding weekly phone calls with the presidents, not just the private uh, college presidents, but the publics are also joining in on those phone calls. And we have talked about uh, these issues. Um, you know, it's a little tricky because uh, the publics, I don't think are under this restriction, but private colleges are, if they do a coordinated approach like to refunds, uh, that could be in violation of antitrust laws. So we have been sharing information about what people are doing, but there is no coordinated approach to that. It's up to each uh, individual institution. Yeah. Um, Kathleen, did you, is your question answered? Yes, I, I think for now, thanks. Okay, uh, Sarita Austin. Um, I'm wondering in the CARES Act, I was hearing that maybe, um, student loan repayment might be delayed and they may, they may waive the interest payments on those. Have you heard anything in terms of some, some, some uh, payback to the students? Yes, there's definitely gonna be money going to the students. Uh, and for example, uh, there, there is, for the money that's set aside for higher education, 50% is going to the institutions to fund uh, students who need help uh, and support and some of their expenses, 50% will go to the institutions. And there are some uh, moratoriums on low repayment as far as I know. Thank you. Okay, thank you um, very much, Susan. Uh, I don't see any other questions at this point. Um, we appreciate your coming in and giving us that update. I, I know that we'll probably be hearing from you again next year. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, um, and you're welcome to continue to stay and, and listen in. Um, next up is Wendy Conde for uh, the University of Vermont. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for having me in today. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a general overview of, of what's happening at UVM, but I wanted to start this conversation by um, offering condolences to the committee um, on the death of former Representative Jeskowitz. I think as many of you know, he was a trustee at UVM for almost six years. He's been an incredible advocate for the work that we do and for our students and also a really wonderful personal friend of mine. So wanted to acknowledge that and offer condolences to everybody on, on his passing. We're gonna really, really miss him. Um, in terms of what's happening at UVM, um, as you all know, students are online um, doing their learning for the rest of the semester. We announced earlier this week that also all of our summer programs will, will be conducted exclusively online. We will not have any residential programs happening this summer. Um, as Susan stated, I, I think she covered a lot of sort of what's happening with students. There are, um, while we think that online is the safe and right thing to do right now for students, it can be challenging. Um, we do have a lot of support systems in place at UVM, the Center for Teaching and Learning, the Center for Writing, um, different areas that students can get support and help if they're having difficulty with their online classes. Um, and I saw a note that went out from our provost to faculty yesterday that was giving them some support in um, continuing their online coursework, offering them some um, resources for help in develop, continuing to develop those to um, making them the best that they can possibly be. So I think that we're trying very um, hard to make sure that we maintain the quality of coursework um, in an online setting for students and that we're supporting faculty um, in the best ways that, that we can. Well, because 
you know, I will say this is this is a difficult thing for students to learn in a different environment. But I also think that it is um, it's hard for faculty because not all of them are used to teaching in an online environment either. So um, the other thing I would mention is that um, this is a, a very unprecedented situation in terms of recruitment. And as, Su as Susan mentioned, um, we're all I think UVM, the state colleges, the independent colleges are all very worried about enrollment, particularly for fall. Um, we don't know if we'll be able as of yet to have students come back and be in person um, on campus during the fall semester. Even if we are able to do that, as Susan mentioned, I'm sure we'll, we're planning for some significant attrition of students who don't feel safe coming coming back to campus um, or have other challenges in coming back to campus. So right now our admissions team and our uh, enrollment management team has been um, trying to be very innovative in ways to show students what UVM is when they can't come physically onto campus. So providing things like our admitted student days um, in an online format, um, sending special communications to families and students, giving them information about UVM and ways that they can contact us and, and be in touch with us. So we're, we're working really hard on that. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening at UVM um, that I think are, are exciting and maybe give folks a little bit of, of hope in, in some of these weird times. Um, as uh, the land grant and research institution, we're, we put a lot of focus and resources right now into um, what we can do to help with the COVID-19 situation. So I'm sure all of you have read online about what we're calling the Vermontilator, which is um, a collaboration with engineering and medical faculty um, to create a new kind of um, ventilator that might actually be even better for people that have this illness um, because it helps um, with inflating the lungs in a different way that might be more beneficial to um, this kind of disease. So those right now, um, there's an application in front of the FDA to be able to start producing those. And we've had a lot of good support and help from our congressional delegation in trying to get that fast tracked because we're gonna be able to produce those for a very low cost um, and would like to start getting them out to um, Vermont, but also other states as quickly as we possibly can to help with this situation. Um, also right now, we have about 117 students left on campus. Um, that's significantly down. We've had almost everybody go home except those 117 represent international students that are barred from going to their home countries at this time. But we are not really using the kitchens um, that we have on campus because there's very few students to, I mean, we are providing meals for those folks, but um, we're not using all of our capacity. So we've been using our kitchens to produce meals for healthcare workers, mostly at UVMMC and also out at Fannie Allen. So um, we're happy that we can do something like that that's helpful. Um, since we have very uh, limited folks on campus, we've given some of our parking lots to UVMMC employees so that they don't have to take shuttles and ride in a compacted area together. Um, this week, I've also heard that one of our parking lots has been taken by the National Guard to set up a new um, testing center because, you know, the fairgrounds is, is getting pretty crowded. So we've got a new testing center site at UVM. Um, and let's see. If my, oh, the, the last thing is that um, UVM's MC, and as everybody knows, there's, there's a lot of issue with capacity for um, processing the COVID-19 tests. And so our College of Medicine has taken their lab space and is now assisting UVMMC with processing those tests so that we can get them done faster and more efficiently and maybe do more testing. So um, that is a lot of what's happening uh, right now at the university. Um, you know, as Susan said, we are concerned um, about fall enrollment. We're concerned about the loss of revenue um, to institutions um, based on that. The CARES Act, as Susan said, um, it is helpful in many ways. The money that will come directly to the University of Vermont um, is about $7 million. 
that will be divided, as she said, into two pieces. About 3.5 will be able to be used by the university for um, some either revenue losses that we're taking in terms of reimbursements to students and families. Um, also some technology costs for online courses, that sort of thing. The other half will be used for emergency grants for students, and that can be used for anything related to COVID problems, um, childcare, healthcare, transportation, um, you know, food, things that they need. So right now, what we're trying to get is some guidance from the federal government on you know, administering those kind of programs and making sure that we're not violating any of their rules and we're spending that money in exactly the right way. Um, everybody, state and federal government, as we all well know, is incredibly overwhelmed at the moment. So we, we've had some trouble getting guidance from the federal government on CARES Act questions, um, but we're, we're just waiting for the Department of Education, USDOE, to come out and give us a little bit more guidance on that. And in my conversations with Senator Leahy staff this morning, they think that money will flow by the end of this month. So, you know, we're, we're expecting it to come in relatively quickly. Um, so uh, it, I think that's about all I have to report. If anybody has questions, I'm happy to take them. Caleb Elder. Thank you, uh, and thanks for the update. And um, it's really interesting to hear uh, and heartening to hear about the work with the ventilator. I've been re reading about that in past days and exciting to think that that innovation is happening yep. right here and now. That's, that's appreciate that update. Um, I'm interested in the, I think you said 117 international students. Um, and I'm just, uh, I guess I'm wondering, uh, given the uncertainty and for all probably the different countries involved with, with different um, orders in terms of travel, is, is there any kind of um, clock uh, on, on UVM's sort of uh, commitment to, to house and feed these folks? Uh, is it just sort of indefinite? Are they going to be sort of under the care of UBM, you know, regardless of what happens this summer, or is this a situation where in May, um, I can say I have a friend who's an international student elsewhere in the country and, and they're facing um, uncertainty about housing um, uh, starting in early May. And I, so I'm just kind of wondering what, what those students can expect heading into the summer um, if they are not able to travel. <laughs> Um, you know, Caleb, I don't really know the answer to that question. I'm happy to check in and find out a definitive answer. As far as I know, our plan is to care for them until they're able to go home. Um, and so uh, I think we're thinking that they're there sort of for the long haul. Um, but I, I can double check on that for you and, and send you an email with a, with a definitive answer on that. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Kathleen James. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I think I know the answer to this, but I just want to confirm. Um, I have been, ex been getting some questions from constituents um, who are concerned about defaulting on their student loans. Mm -hmm. And I, I've just been directing them to the um, resources and information that are available on the VSAC page. Is there anything better I should be telling these, these folks to do? I know they're very concerned. Yeah, um, Kathleen, that's a great question. And um, there is a lot of information on that on the USDOE website. And if you go to their homepage, it's sort of in bold right on the front page. Um, and they list some, some pretty significant information on that. Student loans are going to um, be suspended for six months is what, what came out of the CARES Act. So if people are worried um, about default, they should go to that USDOE page or they can also call their lender um, and make sure that um, they are um, eligible for, for that. I mean, I think at this point, pretty much everybody is. So I think that that will give people some comfort that for six months they can, they can stop paying on the loans. Um, that would be just federal loans though, right? Uh, yes. And okay. I'm not, I'm not certain about the VSAC loans. Um, I don't okay. know the answer to that part. Sorry. 
Great. No, thank you for that, though, because I, I have not been also directing people to the USDOE. So that gives me one more resource for them. So thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Questions here. I didn't see any. Um, so at this point, the, you do not see any emergency uh, uh, statutory changes that are necessary in your functioning or, uh, and that question goes to you too, Susan. Not to my knowledge at, at the moment now. Um, you know, I, I think that we're in, we're in good shape in terms of, of statutory things. Um, and, and we'll see, you know, how things move on from here. I think a lot, I think for independence, Publics, I think a lot depends on what happens for fall. And, and it's just too early for us, us to know the answer to that yet. Um, just to add what I mentioned, the immunity for colleges, you know, providing support. If the governor, governor doesn't do it in executive order, uh, I think we need that to come from the legislature. Okay. And that's just for, just for the colleges that are providing support to uh, address the COVID-19 housing issues. Exactly. Yeah. And I can share with you the draft executive order I did so you can uh, see how that's framed. Yeah, that would be great if you could send that that on. Okay, in terms of the, the, the independent colleges coordinating fees, that gets into federal law. So I don't think we can do anything about that. Um, you know, one thing I'll just mention to you guys um, is that when with this federal stimulus four that's sort of in development right now the congressional delegation has been reaching out to us asking us you know what our needs are and and what things could be included in that that haven't been covered or weren't covered well enough in cares act and as susan said you know we're we're really grateful for the federal funding that's coming you know it's not none of this funding is ever going to make anybody whole and quite frankly as a citizen of this country I get really worried when I see the amount of money that's going into some of these stimulus packages people really need it but it's also daunting to to see the level of funding um, one thing that we were talking to the congressional delegation about is when we look to fall and think about families so many folks have had their incomes lowered significantly and so additional money for federal student aid is important, but also it's important to have a fix for the FAFSA because currently FAFSA looks at prior year tax returns. So people's mm -hmm. current financial situation wouldn't be taken into consideration. So we have asked that um, we think stimulus four is going to be more of an authorizing legislative type of fix of a, of a package more than a, another huge financial package that we could have another huge financial package a little bit later down the line. But one of the things we're asking them to consider is some emergency um, thoughts about um, changing the FAFSA to allow families to show what their um, income changes have been for this year. Okay, thank you. Keep us posted on that. That's a yeah, we'll do. Um, if there aren't any more questions for, for UVM, I would like to go on to um, Jeb Spalding, who will speak to us about the state college system. Good morning, Chair Webb. Good morning. It's a pleasure to see you all. I haven't seen anybody wearing a tie for a while, and I haven't worn a tie for a while myself. So <laughs> uh, thank you for that opportunity. And uh, it's certainly been uh, a very wild ride for the last a month for colleges and universities around this country. I was looking back a, a month ago on the uh, 11th of March or 10th of March, we were still wondering whether it would be better to keep our students on campus or send them uh, home. And our students, had, for the most part, had already come back from a spring break and were on campus, uh, as opposed to some that were getting ready to send their students on, on, on a break. And, uh, in that month, it's been uh, nonstop reacting to uh, changing conditions on, on a daily basis. And I'm incredibly proud of uh, the feat that, uh, you know, the independent colleges and the university and the Vermont State Colleges did by 
going 100% remote uh, in the course of mainly a week for most people. Uh, sometimes it was it was two weeks, but uh, that took uh, quite a lift. Um, you know, there are many stories of how it's working well, uh, and many others where the uh, it's the, the challenge is, is uh, for students and some faculty members. Everything from you know the the way they learn to their uh, ability to access uh, internet or, or appropriate technology uh, has been an issue. Some of our colleges have, have gone out and, to the extent they can get them, gotten laptops to to students so they they could participate. Uh, but uh, there's some uh, supply issues there too. So you know we've been working very hard. Um, there's you know. One important thing to say about the Vermont State Colleges as a group, as, as opposed to uh, any of the other institutions in the state of Vermont, um, you know, we are a single corporation with multiple institutions within it. So uh, it's a, you know a number of moving parts. So the way Community College of Vermont, which is is the uh, is the college that has the largest uh, you know headcount, the largest enrollment. Uh, of any of our colleges, how, how they're reacting and, and uh, being affected is, is different than the other colleges. So when I look at Community College of Vermont, they made the decision right away. Uh, they were going online for the uh, rest of the uh, semester. And, uh, you know, and now they're pretty much made the decision that they're, they will be fully online for uh, the summer too. Uh, they, were, they were almost 50% uh, delivery online uh, when this uh, COVID-19 situation hit. So uh, it was still a lot of work for them, but they were, they were, they were it wasn't uh, uh, the same kind of situation where maybe a, at, at, a, at a Vermont Tech, for example, where, you know, you were trying to figure out how you're going to teach diesel uh, technology online or, or remotely. It's not all online, but remotely. And uh, so CCV is is 100% online. Um, you know, community colleges around the country uh, have uh, been counter cyclical to the economy. So oftentimes, when uh, the job market is uh, like bad and people are unemployed, is when they tend to uh, enroll in community college. Uh, Joyce Judy, President Judy, tells me that that. Is it, it, they're across the country, they're not sure that's going to materialize uh, in this particular situation because there's so much, uh, you know, current uh, disruption in people's daily lives and and uh, their ability to feel comfortable uh, working or going online and so forth that uh, they're not sure that this is not going to be uh, an enrollment issue for Community College of Vermont to some extent. Maybe not the same issues as, as other colleges. So uh, you know, CCV at the moment is uh, 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 is 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 okay. As as a system, uh, I think you, Representative Matos, were you raising your hand or were you? No, I was waving to somebody driving by on the street. Sorry. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> so you know, listen, you know, you know, because uh, we've told you before that the Vermont State Colleges system. Uh, has been in a fairly fragile situation. And around the country, uh, you know, the, the rating agencies have, you know, moved uh, higher education across the, the, the country uh, from, you know, you know, sort of mildly negative to de decidedly negative. Uh, and the co colleges and universities that were the, had the most, uh, the least buffer and, the, and had the most financial challenges are the ones that are most challenged. And I have to say that, uh, you know, a, across this country, uh, you know, the country and every state is in a state of emergency. Many cities like the city of Burlington are in a state of emergency and uh, post-secondary education colleges and universities across this country are at least many in a state of crisis. So, you know, for the Vermont State Colleges, as a single corporation, uh, we were looking at uh, for the at the end of the second quarter, uh, perhaps a, a four million dollar operating deficit for the fiscal year 20 that we're in, and the presidents were working very hard to lower that number. And it, it, it you know when things are sort of up in the air now that we've in the middle of March when the the third quarter was still going on, uh, you know so we still still had 
quite a bit left in this fiscal year. COVID-19 hit us, but they had probably worked that down to maybe maybe two and a half or three million dollar uh, expected loss. Uh, we know that our our we have made the decision, like virtually every other college and university in the country, that it is the right thing to do for students uh, to offer them uh, a refund on uh, the uh, unused portion of uh, dorms and dining room and board. And uh, uh, the way we're doing that is uh, we said, okay, we're, we're definitely gonna do it. It'll be pro rata. The colleges will be figuring out that, uh, but we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna reimburse you uh, within 90 days of the time you, the dorms were, were uh, vacated. So we have a little bit more time to actually uh, sort of fit that into our, our payment schedule, but that's gonna be, uh, last I saw for the, the corporate level, $5.6 million. Um, then there is uh, in May and June, uh, some, you know, not, not the same scale as, as room and board or tuition, but there, there is, or, or regular semester tuition, but there are events and camps and, uh, at Castleton, they've had for 40 years, Representative Capoli, the, uh, some kind of drum and bugle corps from down in Boston that comes up. And that there is, a, is a, I think it was a $110,000 contract that was, that was uh, canceled early. So, uh, you know, we're looking uh, really at, a, at approximately a, a, a $10 million uh, operating loss in, in this fiscal year. Uh, and that includes, you know, just sort of to, uh, so that's a challenge. There's no question about it. We are looking at uh, ways to uh, access some additional uh, financing to tide us over, not to meet payroll, but to meet some of our unanticipated losses uh, and the transition costs. Uh, we are uh, you know, actively talking with the, the federal delegation. I'm sure that uh, Susan Stightley and Wendy Koenig have already told you that uh, we do appreciate what the feds uh, have done and I hope that's okay word to use what the federal government has done, Congress and, and, and Washington. But, uh, you know, for us, uh, the, the, the money in the CARES Act is, is about uh, just over $6 million. Uh, and that has to go out 50% uh, to assist our students that are in need. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing. And we're very supportive. Uh, but that leaves about 3 million to cover our room and board losses and other losses of revenue. So, you know, maybe it's going to cover uh, half of those losses, uh, but not anywhere near fully. Um, I did want to mention to the, the, the committee that, uh, you know, as part of the, the CARES Act, there, there is a, uh, an allocation for each state's governor to uh, distribute emergency aid across, the, as I understand it, pre-K through post-secondary. And that uh, and Vermont is eligible for about four and a half uh, uh, million on that. And you know we have put in our request to the administration that we would really be, appreciate being considered for that. Uh, you know higher education uh, is is critical to the future of the state of Vermont. Um, but you know uh, uh, we don't receive the funding level that that uh, other other levels of education do. Uh, and I, I think I saw that in, in, in Vermont that the, the portion of the CARES package for elementary and secondary was going to be bringing in 30 million plus for the state of Vermont. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we, we have put in our request and would appreciate support for a significant sum of that money to uh, help us cover our losses. Uh, you know, I also, I, and maybe you can clarify it for this for me at some point, but you know, there are also like, like over a billion dollars coming to the state of Vermont uh, in the CARES Act. And my understanding is that money uh, would really not be available for, uh, for post-secondary education. I, I don't know if I've really had verification of that or not. And maybe, maybe Wendy or Susan knows different, but uh, if, if there was flexibility there, that would be very helpful. So, uh, you know, the, the, the loss in this fiscal year, current fiscal year is, is, is substantial. Uh, what's as worrying, if not more so, is what's going to happen in the future. Uh, and the future is uh, very uncertain. You know, we're, should we be planning to uh, be open uh, in the fall uh, with our residential facilities? Uh, if we weren't, uh, that is a total game changer. 
uh, and uh, you know, I mean, I, I really, I, I honestly have a hard time getting my mind around that. Uh, but you know, if we were looking at a, a you know 15 to 30 percent enrollment decline, depending on uh, which institution you are, and that gets back to a little bit of a, a different situation we have, and 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 you know, progn prognostications and so forth. But uh, you know, one potential uh, advantage that you know, in 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 a, in a really uh, topsy turvy world is that you know the majority of our students are Vermonters, uh, and there is some indication that, that you know that our colleges are getting more interest from Vermonters to stay at home. And roughly 50% of our high school graduates that are going on to college are currently going out of state, uh, and it, that may be some some small. Uh, you know, I don't know if the word is, you know, assistance to us in terms of our enrollment. Uh, we worry about, uh, you know, their ability to afford to go with the, the job losses. And we also worry about our out-of-state enrollment, uh, whether the reverse is, is, is likely to happen, where students are going to make the decision to stay closer to home, uh, look for the more affordable option. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think my own guess is that that even though it's impressive that the amount of remote learning that was stood up pretty fast. Uh, I, I think a lot of students are not looking forward to that experience going forward. That's not why they go to a Northern Vermont University or a, or a, or a, I don't know what, a St. Michael's, it doesn't matter whether you're public or private, where, where these are high touch institutions with uh, a wide range of, of, of activities and athletics that uh, that's, a, that's, that's very different than, than Southern New Hampshire University. So. Uh, you know, looking forward uh, is is a cloudy picture, but not one that we're we're you know, we're uh, wearing rose-colored glasses with. So, uh, committee, we are currently uh, you know going through all kinds of analysis about you know what we should do and what we could how could we cover our losses, what are we projecting? Uh, you know, I mean, most of our costs are are are, are personnel related. Uh, and, you know, we, you know, just in the chancellor's office, just so you know, I mean, there's, they're mainly across the system right now. It's, it started with, uh, with, you know, freeze on hiring, freeze on travel, ratchet back to your expenditures, uh, don't hire anybody new. Uh, but also we're getting to the point where we're looking at, well, okay, you know, are there ways that we are a either having people that are on payroll that uh, are not not able to do to either work remotely or that are or have jobs that are so student facing and, and some are some are facing that uh, they they're they're not able to to do the job they were assigned to do uh, and uh, you know how, how do we handle that uh, and you know we don't have an answer there but I expect I expect we're we're, we're going to have to take some personal act personnel actions in the in the coming weeks and one thing that's uh, a little different than uh, and I, I I don't know whether I, I'm sure the independent colleges have something that's uh, you know they may have similar kinds of things and they may not but you know we have uh, a lot of union contracts and uh, they generally have 45 or 60 day lead times on you know once you notice somebody uh, that you know you got to you, you have you're still paying them for 45 to 60 days, which is a good thing in this climate, but it adds to uh, our uh, inflexibility to deal quickly with uh, the, uh, the the revenue situation we have. In the chancellor's office, you know, at any given time, and we're we're tiny, but just you know, we we generally have, uh, uh, you know, in the in the in the ball of ballpark of 36 to 38, 39 people at any given time. Uh, we have uh, eliminated four positions where there were people that were in them that are uh, now in their their lead time. Uh, but uh, those are positions we we uh, at least for the foreseeable future don't anticipate bringing back. Uh, we have not filled vacancies, uh, and you know I just need you to know it's 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 not going to be it's not going to be something that uh, we enjoy doing, and you know. Uh, Again, uh, going back just for a second, and then I'll stop and answer questions. But uh, you know, we are a single corporation with four independently accredited—not independent, but separately accredited institutions: Community College of Vermont, Castleton University, Northern Vermont University, and Vermont Technical College. And uh, you know, 
as opposed to an independent college, if you were to do a reconfiguration, let's say maybe you thought you don't you don't you 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 thought we you might not need that many institutions. Uh, the costs, the allocable capital debt, the retiree health costs, uh, the payouts, uh, the uh, cost to maintain a campus don't go away. They get shuttered down, cascaded onto the remaining smaller corporation. So, you know, uh, where I'm going with that is, you know, we're looking at all alternatives, not sure what the structure is, but we need to be able to give certainty uh, to our students, families, employees sometime in the in the coming weeks so that they can have confidence about what the future is going to be. And, uh, you know, our presidents and uh, the chancellor's office and our board of trustees uh, is, you know, uh, absolutely committed to being able to take the steps that are going to be necessary for us to be able to sustain our mission into the future. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that is to, to, to provide uh, accessible, affordable, uh, relevant uh, education and training for Vermonters. And uh, that's what we're going to do. And if we have to make difficult decisions, we will do it. But when, when we do, we will have confidence in what the future will be. Uh, and uh, I know that the state of Vermont is under a lot of pressure. I mean, you know, just, a, you know, I don't, I don't read the, the revenue forecast as regularly as you do, but I read them enough to know it's, 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 it's I don't know, daunting is probably not enough, a big enough word for it. Uh, and, but that's the world we're all living in right now is daunting uh, and, uh, and complex uh, and wanting to do the very best by our, our institutions, our fa faculty, staff, and students. The state appropriation uh, is absolutely critical to our future. And, you know, uh, I, I hope that, uh, you know, as you, you know, try to figure out what solutions, uh, you know, might work for the state, uh, that, you know, we can protect our state appropriation. You know, maybe we can't anticipate significant increases, but, you know, a loss of that appropriation or, or a substantial reduction in that appropriation would significantly add to the challenges we have to configuring ourselves to uh, to meet the future, because just you know even if we did get smaller, we still have a lot of carrying costs that are that are 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 going to continue for for a very long time. Whether we're you know so if you're losing revenue, but you have ongoing costs whether you're operating or not, uh, that's that's difficult uh, and, 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 and uh, can, be, can be very damaging. So I'm um, just making a plea that A, if we could uh, get assistance from the state for the, uh, the governor's emergency funds, that would be critical. Uh, and if we could maintain our state appropriation, that would be critical. And with that, Madam Chair and others, I'd be happy to try to answer questions. Um. Great. I have a couple. First of all, you said in the fiscal year, you're seeing a potential $10 million uh, deficit. Yes. Um, what is your fiscal year? Uh, June 30, so July 1, same as the state. Okay. So it's $10 million for for this one. It's yes. the current one that's ending very soon. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And from one of you, I think our committee would appreciate uh, if someone could send um, the care uh, the CARES Act bullet points that uh, affect uh, higher ed would be helpful for us. And I think you you I, add, I've got yeah. I've got a really good summary of that, Kate. I'll send it to you and you and I'll send it to Avery too, so you can put it up. Yeah, send it to, send it to Avery. It would be great. Okay. Yeah. You can post it and, and to me would be great as well. Um, and I think that you 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 predicted a question that folks might have asked related to, uh, are you considering um, other options to reduce your expenses, one being the potential closure of, of campuses? Well, you know, I, I, I don't want to beat around the bush too much, but we're, we're looking at, at all options and, and uh, you know, uh, getting smaller in some fashion is, is probably, uh, you know, is, is, is going to be mandatory. How we do it, I don't know yet. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, you, you, I think you know that 
uh, last summer and fall, uh, we were going through a process of the state college system to identify uh, the very serious headwinds that were, uh, were facing uh, higher education around the country, particularly uh, in rural areas that uh, had some demographic issues. And, you know, uh, we, we identified those as, as you know, the, the demographics, the, the pricing pressure from state, uh, low state funding and uh, discounts by other colleges trying to compete for a smaller population, uh, you know, students wondering and, and families wondering about whether it was the right investment for them changes in technology and, and com competition from uh, you know big online and, and, and folks who can deliver things cheaper uh, that are very very well funded and not the same thing at all but for many or many students they it works pretty well uh, especially students that may have families and challenges so uh, families and other obligations work obligations and so forth and uh, you know a sizable percentage of the college students these days are, are adult students so uh, you know we already had some very serious uh, headwinds that we were trying to uh, to deal with. We we had our presidents uh, in the middle of developing uh, action plans to try to uh, offset those uh, those headwinds. But you know, I have to say that, that COVID nineteen has not just accelerated the need for action, but it's intensified uh, you know those challenges. It's, I don't know if it's going to change the the birth rate, but it's it's certainly, uh, you know, changing the calculation that families are making about can they afford to to do this? Do do they want to do it? Are they getting what they pay for? Uh, and uh, you know, uh, what, what the competitive landscape is going to look like? And I guess the competitive landscape is going to be less. I mean, as I see around the country, uh, you know, there are. And by the way, we're really no different. I mean, I read this is a daily publication today studying. Okay. You know the the, the uh, furloughs and layoffs—they're coming next, and they listed a number of you know universities and colleges around the country that were moving to that stage now. Uh, and it's not that any of them want to do it; they don't want to do it. You know, uh, but you know they need to be to be taking the action to ensure that their their entity uh, can can survive to be able to provide uh, the important education and, and training opportunities for the future. We have a couple of questions. Um, Kathleen James and then Larry Cooperly. Thanks. Um, probably more a question for um, for Kate, but just uh, following along on Jeb's, um, you know, request about the state appropriation for the Vermont State Colleges system. The letter that the Education Committee submitted to the Appropriations Committee seems like another lifetime ago. Will we be? updating those letters or resubmitting to the House of Probes here in the new world? That's my only question, thanks. Yeah, that, that, that whatever work the committee was, the appropriation committee was doing uh, uh, four weeks ago, um, it's totally off. It's a complete, it's almost like they're starting from scratch. So um, Larry Coopley. Yeah, Jeb, um, I, I wanna reference uh, Vermont Technical College. Um, in relation to the layoff that we've just had at the General Electric plant here in Rutland, have you had any conversations um, with the with the college um, regarding that? I have not, but would happy to be do, do so. In fact, I'll be uh, uh, meeting the same way we're meeting here with with President uh, Moulton uh, shortly today. So, okay, thank that. you. Uh, and what you know, give me a little hint there as, as to what your your what 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 the angle you're thinking of is. I mean, I know they've had 500 layoffs. Uh, you 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 you're on mute. There. there we are. We good? Yep. Yeah, and that 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 was my concern. I know that there's there's programming being done, and programs afforded to people from General Electric by Vermont Technical College, and I'm just wondering. Um, if you know if that those programs obviously are going to be interrupted uh, and I'm not sure what the if there's monetary issues there um, that would also affect your your um, budgeting but I uh, I do know that General Electric has been utilizing Vermont Technical College as a as a learning institution for their employees and um, I'm sure that that has stopped at this point right. we do have roughly 470 people who have been laid off um, and, you know, it's certainly going to affect our community as well. They're a, they're a big employer. I mean, there are 1,500 people down there that, um, that we're really concerned about. So, yeah. 
I just didn't know had you talked with President Malton about that. So if, you know, I'd like to hear a little more about it if it comes up. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, we're, you know, I, I can't believe how fast these days are going by. You know, it's like you start very early and then it's, you know, you're exhausted at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, we're spending time and just trying to say, okay, we, we know we're critical for the state of Vermont. We know that. And we know Vermonters depend on us. Uh, and we know we have, you know, loyal faculty and staff. Uh, but we know in the end, you know, we have to be able to, you know, meet our, our obligations, including, you know, compensation. And uh, uh, that's got to drive what we can do. And, you know, we, we are looking at uh, how we can cooperate with each other. Uh, you know, what are the most important programs that we need to protect? Uh, and certainly the, the uh, you know, the employer partnerships that, that uh, Vermont Tech uh, and uh, Community College of Vermont and, and the rest of the folks uh, for institutions are uh, one of those things that we, we need to uh, protect in one form or another. So if I, uh, Wendy? So I just wanted to bring one thing up and, and I think Jeb is, is probably aware of this and I think Susan is too, but one of the things that the CARE Act, the CARES Act contains is a maintenance of effort provision for both K through 12 and for higher ed um, in terms of state appropriation. So essentially what it's saying is if states take money from the CARES Act that they're required to, um, to keep a, um, the same appropriation on a basis of um, a, a three-year average. There is a, a piece of that where you can apply for a waiver. So there is a loophole to it, but I think Jeb's point about trying even in these very difficult times to maintain state appropriation is so critical for UVM and the state colleges. I mean, you know, a $10 million loss for the state colleges um, before the fiscal year, we're looking at something bigger than that. You know, if we if we lose state appropriation, that's that's really tough. So I'm I'm happy that we have that maintenance of effort provision, but just want to try to maintain that too. Thanks. So if what I'm hearing so far is from the independent colleges, you're asking for, you're, you're seeking something related to immunity for the independent colleges in the face of, of housing people during the, the COVID-19 response. From everybody, you're hoping that the governor will uh, consider using the emergency funds at his discretionary funds to address our colleges and from the um, state and colleges and the university uh, maintaining the appropriation. Is that, have I, have I hit where uh, our role is? Uh, Representative Webb, I, I would say uh, on the immunity issue, we wouldn't mind being part of that as well. Um, you know, we, we, have, uh, we have beds For right sure. now that are, that are set up at the Spartan Arena, Castleton Spartan Arena. We are uh, glad to do it. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the state was in a hurry, uh, a big hurry. And, you know, basically, uh, in, in normal times, we would have made sure we had more protections in the lease uh, in case something goes wrong. Now, you know, you might say, and I did say, well, there's not as much that could go wrong in a hockey rink as there are when people start coming into dorms and things like that. But Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, 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 the immunity uh, for 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 colleges and universities that are, are having to uh, you know house different uh, surge over, overflows and surges would be helpful for everybody. I think. Okay. Yeah, we're we're in the same boat with Patrick, but I want to give a shout out and thanks to Susan because when she wrote all that, she included us. So I, I just want to say that also the cooperation between everybody has, has been really wonderful. So thank you, Susan, for, for working on that. And Susan, you've sent that uh, request for an executive order to, to us, is that correct? Going to, yeah. going to. Okay, and um, Jim, it would be great if you could take a look at that and uh, see if that's something that, that we can do or if it belongs to a different committee, I'm not sure. Um, other questions? I really appreciate hearing from you. Um, what we are clearly in a, a time where it's very hard to predict what's gonna be happening in September. 
Um, yeah, it uh, is. I mean, I, as somebody who's been around for a long time, just taking off my higher ed hat, I'm, I'm sure like the rest of you, I'm very concerned about the, uh, uh, you know, the, the future decades uh, as a result of uh, this, this crisis. The economic, I mean, you know, the, the health is awful. And I, you know, that I, you probably already did this uh, before I was on, but, uh, you know, the loss of, of, of friends, uh, you know, I, as I say this right now, I, I should, things can change every day, but the last I checked was probably a week ago. Uh, I'm not aware of any of our employees uh, or students that uh, have been, uh, you know, identified as COVID positive, but, you know, we certainly have a lot of people who have been uh, impacted in their families and uh, the uh, associate uh, dean of student life, or that's a, roughly what her title is, has been a longtime employee of Vermont Technical College. His father was Bernie Jeskowitz, and uh, you know, I mean, there are those stories of people that we know that uh, have been impacted, uh, and that's a terrible loss. But the economic impact, wow, you know, and I mean, I I think, um, you know, I, I'm not Art Wolf, and I'm not uh, you know Tom Cavett and or Jeff Carr, but this is going to take a, a, a quite a while, and there will be new new folks that come along, but. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't think higher education is, is immune from that. And I didn't hear Susan's testimony, so I'm not going to speculate about Vermont. But, you know, across this country, uh, there there will be fewer uh, post-secondary institutions. Well, we you were treasurer when we had uh, the Great Recession in 2009, I, I believe. And yes. like, that was almost easy compared to this. I mean, that was more human caused. This is yeah. something different. Well, I was pretty scared at that point too, but but it, but it was it wasn't this, it wasn't as long lasting. It took a long time to recover, and you know I was uh, secretary of administration when Irene hit, but that was horrible. But it was a short duration crisis event of of rescue and recovery, as opposed to this continual coming and coming and coming. And then it's the the, re the receipt, and it's everywhere, and you can't even see it. You know, it's like, but it's. Uh, you know, it's, it, this is a whole different kettle of fish. Well, let us all um, also recognize the opportunity that is in here as well. Um, Absolutely. It's not, yeah. has not revealed itself quite yet to me, uh, but I think that there is opportunity for us to be rethinking a, a bunch of things. We're certainly looking at that with, with pre-K-12 as well. Right. And thank you for that, Representative Webb. Very important. And we certainly are trying to do that. Okay, I don't see any other questions at this point. Um, thank you so much for for joining us today. We appreciated hearing from you. Everybody, nobody else has a question. Okay, thank you. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you very much. Please soldier on. Thank you, you guys too. Thanks for your work. Okay, thank you.